Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today and welcome. Today's webinar is What do cold hands have to do with glaucoma? My name is Elena Sturman. I am the president and CEO of the Glaucoma Foundation. Our mission at TGF is to improve the lives of glaucoma patients by encouraging and supporting innovative research and providing news and education for scientists, physicians, patients, and the public. Flammer syndrome describes the phenotype of people with a predisposition for an altered reaction of the blood vessels to stimuli like coldness or emotional stress. Nearly all organs, particularly the eye, can be involved. Joining us tonight is Dr. Joseph Flemmer. Dr. Flemmer is an ophthalmologist and longtime director of the eye clinic at Basel University Hospital. In addition to noting what we now call Flemmer syndrome, he demonstrated the relationship between eye disease and heart disease. Dr. Flemmer has published hundreds of original papers and is the author of several books. His book, Glaucoma, intended for the general public, has so far been published in 22 languages. It is considered the world's most widely used book on the subject. His basic sciences in ophthalmology has received praise for demonstrating the role of chemistry in physics in modern ophthalmological diagnostics and therapies. Dr. Flemmer is joined by glaucoma patient Hilary Gordon. You may already know a little something about Hilary since we featured her in our recent newsletter. She was diagnosed in 2020 with normal tension glaucoma and later discovered through her own research that she has a lot of the signs of this vascular dysregulation described by Dr. Flemmer. We look forward to hearing how she met Dr. Flemmer and confirmed the diagnosis and how she experiences Flemmer syndrome. There will be question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You can pose your question anytime by using the chat button, and we look forward to answering them. Please welcome Hilary Golden and Dr. Joseph Flemmer, and let's begin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I also would like to welcome you from my side, dear mm -hmm. Elena, dear Hilary. Thank you very, nice, very much for this nice invitation and the kind introduction. Now I think I have to, to share my screen so that you can see my, uh, one second, that you can see my slides. Sorry. One second, please. Okay. Now, there we are, okay. What have cold hands to do with glaucoma? In other words, what is the role of primary vascular dysregulation in glaucoma? This is the content we will discuss. First, I would like to show you how we came across this topic and then list the symptoms and signs of the FS, of the Flammer syndrome, and then why Flammer syndrome is a risk factor for glaucoma, and finally, the therapeutical consequences for glaucoma patients with Flammer syndrome. My presentation is based on scientific literature that you can find and download from this webpage, glaucomaresearch.ch, together with uh, easy to understand explanations. I will show this address again at the end of my presentation. I started residency in Bern, where Hans Goldman had developed the Goldman Applanation Tonometry and the Goldman Kinetic Perimetry. And he wanted us to study the influence of intraocular pressure on glaucoma progression. And we found that mean intraocular pressure correlates with progression, both with the in increase of the scotomas and with the overall constriction of the isoptos. To our surprise, however, we found that IOP fluctuation correlated even higher than the mean intraocular pressure, particularly the progression of the concentric constriction of the isoptos. 
why fluctuation is even more important than the mean intraocular pressure, we will see during this presentation. And then I joined the group of Franz Frankhauser. He had just developed the octopus and he wanted us to optimize the octopus for the using glaucoma. And so we developed the visual field indices, the glaucoma program G1. And in order to separate lo local damage from diffuse damage, the cumulative defect curve, better known as PBA curve. Equipped with these methods, we measured the visual fields of our glaucoma patients, and we found they often are not so typical as shown in the textbooks. And quite often, or even mostly, they have both a diffuse and a local component, and they, they fluctuate over time. Then I had the chance to do a fellowship with Stephen Renz in Vancouver, and he wanted us to study the influence of glaucoma treatment on the visual fields. And to our surprise, we found some reversibility, but only when treated with Diamox and not with other drugs, for example, Timolol. Knowing from experimental studies that Diamox improves the blood flow in the eye, we concluded that the reversibility is less dependent on IOP reduction, but rather on ocular blood flow improvement. This finding motivated me to consider in glaucoma always both intraocular pressure and blood flow. After my return to Switzerland, a young lady with normal tension glaucoma was referred to me. She looks very healthy, athletic, slim, and she worked as a university professor. Based on my medical background, I did a comprehensive examination on her and found a normal internal status except for low blood pressure and striking cold hands. So therefore, we did a nail fold capillary microscopy on her combined with a cold provocation and found the blood flow velocity in these capillaries was slowed and the flow stop after cold provocation prolonged and both improved after a single dose of nifedipine. The diagnosis for such a findings at that time was vasospastic disorder. Thereafter, we found other glaucoma patients, particularly normal tension glaucoma patients with such a vasospastic disorder. Therefore, we were interested whether this blood flow behavior and the visual fields have some relationship. To study this, we did both capillary microscopy and perimetry under baseline condition, after cold stimulation and after an ifedipine treatment, and we found a high relationship. Therefore, we concluded that some normal tension glaucoma patients have a vasospastic disorder, which manifests itself in the fingers as well as in the visual system. Then we measured the blood pressure over 24 hours and found a relative low blood pressure over the day and overnight in normal tension glaucoma patients and in high tension glaucoma patients that progressed despite the normalized IOP. Whereas primary open ended glaucoma patients who were stable after IOP reduction had, on average, a blood pressure like the normal controls. So therefore, we concluded that systemic hypertension might be a risk factor for glaucomatous damage and that there is a relationship between low blood pressure and vasospastic disorder. Then we measured the blood flow in these retroocular vessels with the color Doppler imaging. And we found in all the blood vessels measured a reduced flow velocity, again in normal tension glaucoma patients and in high tension glaucoma patients that progressed despite the normalized IOP. Whereas the glaucoma patients who were stable after IOP reduction had a blood flow behavior like the normal controls. 
Then we wanted to know whether the coronary arteries might also be involved in some patients. And so therefore, we did a 24-hour ECG and searched for ST depressions because this is our science for silent myocardial ischemia. And we found such episodes, interestingly, mostly during sleep, in about 50% of the normal tension glaucoma patients and in about 25% of the high tension glaucoma patients. So we concluded the coronary arteries can also be involved in some patients. The more we studied this blood flow behavior of our glaucoma patients, the more we realized that the phenomenon we observed was different from vasospasma. Vasospasma are normally quite locally and occur only in the arteries. What we observed was a more complex dysregulation affecting arteries, capillaries, and veins. And it was also clear different from renal disease. In renal disease, we have arterial vasospasma they constrict very quickly and to such an extent that the finger turn real white and atrophic uh, atrophies appear at the fingertip. We never saw such uh, atrophic changes at the fingertips of our glaucoma patients. To delineate uh, this finding from spasma, we introduced the term primary vascular dysregulation. Primary because this Vascular dysregulation we observed in these glaucoma patients was not caused by another disease. Then we asked the question whether this could be due to an imbalance of the autonomic nerve system. So therefore, we did ECGs with bead-to-bead -bead variation analysis, because this variability is under the control of the autonomic nerve system. And we found that indeed the activity of the autonomic nerve system is changed in our glaucoma patients. However, this cannot be the cause for the vascular dysregulation because we saw the same type of dysregulation in the non innervated retinal blood vessels, arteries, and veins. Finally, we found the problem in the vascular endothelial cells. These cells line the inside of all blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. And these cells here shown in blue have a number of very important functions. And one is the regulation of the vascular tone. And they release molecules that influence the tone of these smooth basal cells of the blood vessels. Now, if we flick a light to the fundus of a healthy person, then the arteries and veins dilatate very quickly. This so-called flow-mediated vasodilation relies on the function of the vascular endothelial cells. When we repeated this in our patients with primary vascular dysregulation, this response was clear, smaller, sometimes even absent. Therefore, we concluded that we are dealing with a certain type of a vascular endotheliopathy. This endotheliopathy, however, had some similarities, but also clear differences to the endothelial dysfunction in the classical cardiovascular diseases. And then we realized that patients with primary vascular dysregulation have certain signs and symptoms more often than the average population. So therefore, we introduced the term primary vascular dysregulation syndrome. But then a group of experts from different countries and different fields under the lead of Katrina Konietzka replaced this term primary vascular dysregulation by the term Flammer syndrome. And since then, this term is used in the scientific literature. Now, how is it defined? Flammer syndrome is an inborn tendency to react differently, particularly with the blood vessels, to a number of stimuli like coldness or emotional stress. Which people have Flammer syndrome? Well, there is certainly a, a genetic predisposition. Women more of, are affected more often than men, slender more often than obese, 
indoor workers more often than blue color workers, Asians more often than Caucasians. And the symptoms manifest themselves mainly, but not only, between puberty and menopause. There are a number of symptoms that occur, occur quite often, like cold extremities, low blood pressure, they are often slim and sportive, have increased smell sensitivity, more often tinnitus, sometimes even acute hearing loss, increased pain sensation, altered drug sensitivity, long sleep onset time, reduced feeling of thirst. They are normally ambitious, successful, perfectionist, and often intellectual. I do not have time to explain them all. Just two examples, altered sleep behavior. We all fell asleep only after warming up our feet to a certain temperature. This is a strict rule for everybody. There is no exception. Now, because the people with flammer syndrome on average have cooler feet when they go to bed, they need longer to warm them up and therefore they have a longer sleep onset time. Another example is the altered drug sensitivity. As we will see in a moment, patients, this type of patients have an altered uh, uh, expression of certain genes. Some are up and others are downregulated. Among them are also the different ATP transport proteins, and they transport foreign molecules, including drugs. And this explains at least partially the altered drug sensitivity. Then there are a number of objective signs that occur much more often in these people. Increased oxidative stress, altered gene expression, increased altitude sensitivity, more frequent optic disc hemorrhages, increased retinal venous pressure, faster pulse wave propagation, higher spatial irregularities. You can see that in the retina. But sometimes you see even these blotches when these people are under emotional stress. Increased activation of astrocytes and more often optic nerve compartment syndrome. Again, for time reason, I cannot discuss them all. Just one example, this is the increased retinal venous pressure. If you look to the fundus of the eye of healthy people, or in most healthy people, the veins pulsate at the optic nerve head or at its border. If, the vein, if a vein does not pulsate, it means that the pressure in this vein is higher than the intraocular pressure. And this is very often due to a, sorry, to a vasoconstriction of this vein, either here at the surface or deeper at the lamina cavosa, where we can see it directly, or also where arteries and veins cross. And this constriction is most often induced by endothelin, which can diffuse from the choroidea into this area. And we know from ex vivo studies that the veins are about 10 times more sensitive to endothelin than the arteries. Now, glaucoma patients often have retinal venous pressure than, higher than intraocular pressure. And retinal, this retinal venous pressure is even higher in glaucoma patients with Flammer syndrome. And it is our clinical experience that the progression often stops only after lowering this retinal venous pressure. Then we measured, together with Michael Berchi, both intraocular pressure and retinal venous pressure in mountain climbers at different altitudes. And we found that while IOP did not change, retinal venous pressure increased as they went up. And as a general rule, we can say the lower the oxygen partial pressure, the higher the endothelial level, and therefore also the retinal venous pressure. And this increase of both endothelial and retinal venous pressure is much stronger in subjects with Flammer syndrome. Now, Flammer syndrome is not only a risk factor for normal tension glaucoma, it's also a risk factor to some extent for a number of other diseases which we don't discuss now, you find it also on the web page. However, I like to emphasize that people with Flammer syndrome are mostly healthy. They have certain disadvantages that we just discussed, 
but also some advantages. In other words, some diseases occur more often in this type of people and others less often. Coming back to glaucoma, why is Flammer syndrome a risk factor for glaucoma dust damage? These people have on average a lower blood pressure and a higher retinal venous pressure and therefore a reduced perfusion pressure and, and so also a reduced blood flow. And they have a disturbed autoregulation. You can easily im im imagine if, if the regulation of the blood flow in the eye is, is disturbed, then a fluctuation of blood pressure, a fluctuation of intraocular pressure translates directly to fluctuation of blood flow in the eye. And this unstable blood flow increases the oxidative stress in the mitochondria and here in glaucoma, especially in the mitochondria of the axons of the optic nerve head. If we consider the entire population, then we have a broad range. On one extreme, we have the people with risk factors for atherosclerosis, like obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, etc. You know them. Now, interestingly, each of these risk factors for atherosclerosis is also a weak but significant risk factor for an increase in intraocular pressure. And therefore, statistically spoken, they have more often high tension glaucoma. If we go to the other extreme, we find more people with Flammer syndrome and because they have a low perfusion pressure and a disturbed autoregulation, they have more often a normal tension glaucoma. However, I like to emphasize that vascular disorders and increased intraocular pressure are not mutually exclusive. They can rather damage synergistically. People with bad circulation are at similar risk as people with an increased in, uh, intraocular pressure. And patients that have both the bad circulation and an increased intraocular pressure are at particular risk for progression. So therefore, we often have to do both to reduce intraocular pressure and to improve ocular blood flow. And I like to mention that by reducing intraocular pressure, we also improve blood flow to some extent, particularly in patients with a disturbed autoregulation. This brings me now to the treatment of glaucoma, of glaucoma patients with Flammer syndrome. First, what should patients with Flammer syndrome avoid? I know it's not that easy, but at least they should try to avoid prolonged exposure to cold, severe psychological stress, extreme physical activity, rapid increase to high altitude. And they should care for nutrition rich on in certain uh, antioxidants. The details, concrete details, as you also find on the web page. Then what should FS patients keep in mind when taking drugs? They should try to avoid vasoconstrictive drugs as much as it is possible, like adrenaline and other adrenergic drugs. They can occur in eye drops, in ear drops, in nose drops. They, they are often added into local anesthetics. The reason why we try to avoid them is the fact that they have another uh, uh, sensitivity to, to adrenaline, they often have a real over response. Watch out, certain drugs have a blood pressure lowering side effect, for example, sleeping pills. This means if you have a low blood pressure during sleep, try to avoid sleeping pills. Certain drugs are not tolerated by EFS patients in normal doses. However, they are very well tolerated and have a good effect when given at the much lower dose. And this brings us now to the treatment of glaucoma patients with Flammer syndrome. The first question is how to improve vascular regulation. We often use magnesium, relative high dose of magnesium, if possible, or low dose of a calcium channel blocker, particularly ferripin or sometimes amlodipine. We can also combine the two. Actually, we combine very often. There are other molecules described in the literature to improve regulation. 
And we hope that the pharmaceutical industry will come up with these more molecules soon. Are there any particular recommended glaucoma medications? Yes, this might surprise you. We often give betaxel. We add betaxel the standard IOP lowering treatment. Because betaxel, although it reduces the intraocular pressure only slightly, it has a good effect on the long-term visual field prognosis. In this review, we have summarized the literature, the available literature with all the studies on betaxolol. This beneficial effect is most probably due to the fact that betaxolol has a calcium antagonizing side effect. Are there recommended antioxidants? Among the many, we most often use ginkgo because the molecules in ginkgo, these antioxidative molecules, really reach the inner membrane of the mitochondria where the damaging glaucoma occurs. How to increase a too low blood pressure? We recommend an increased salt intake, particularly in the evening before going to sleep. In severe rare cases, we treat with low-dose fludrocortisone. Note that fludrocortisone is a mineralocorticoid and does not have all the side effects of a glucocorticoid. Adrenergic drugs to increase blood pressure are counterproductive. They bring up the blood pressure, but at the same time, they constrict the vessels in the eye. So this is not what we, li what we like. And in rare cases, it can even be dangerous. I remember a young man with Flammer syndrome hospitalized for a sepsis and because he had a very low blood pressure, he got an infusion containing adrenaline. And he had such an overreaction, an over response to adrenaline that he lost his fingertips. Then as we already mentioned, we should lower an increased retinal venous pressure. This can be done with low dose of nifedipine or even better with a vitamin supplementation containing L-methylfolate, the so-called ocovolin forte. We often have to combine the two. Now, the meaning and the examination and the treatment of an increased intraocular pressure is explained in more details on a video you find also on the web page. Then there are alternative therapies like acupuncture, a traditional medicine, a borage tea. From my point of view, it is worthwhile at least to try them. Uh, I know further studies are on the way, particularly with traditional medicine. And this brings me to the end. I like to summarize. Glaucoma patients with Flammer syndrome often have a disturbed autoregulation, arterial hypotension, and increased retinal venous pressure, and therefore reduced and unstable ocular blood flow. And this increases the oxidative stress, particularly in the mitochondria of the axons, and an activation to the astrocytes, and finally, tissue damage. At the end, I would like to mention once more, you find all this information on glaucomaresearch.ch together with uh, easy to understand explanations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Flammer, for this fascinating presentation. Now we'll hear from a glaucoma patient, Hilary Golden. Hilary. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, Dr. Flammer, for the amazing presentation. I am, I was diagnosed with severe normal tension glaucoma in July of 2020. I had a sty on my eyelid and I was furloughed from my job because of COVID. So I had time to go to the doctor. When I went to the OD, they said, do you have time to do a full eye exam? And it had been about over a year since I'd had one. So I agreed. When the OD looked in my eye, she said, I don't like the look of your nerve. And I said, well, I'm here for a sty, so I'm more worried about the sty. And she said, well, I'm more worried about your nerve. At that point, I knew nothing about glaucoma and uh, I agreed to do further tests to find out if glaucoma was a problem for me. 
Once we did those tests, she said, I need you to see a glaucoma specialist as soon as possible. When I went to the glaucoma specialist, my pressures were at 13 and 14, so super low. In the previous four years, I had been to three different ophthalmologists. None of them said anything about my nerve and all of them took my pressure. So normal tension glaucoma is usually not diagnosed until there's significant damage because the pressure is normal. And sometimes the nerve doesn't catch the eye, so to speak, of the ophthalmologist. The glaucoma specialist also had me do an MRI because with a lot of normal tension glaucoma patients, we have to do, um, they wanna rule out any neurological damage. My damage was ex almost exactly the same in both eyes. So she wanted me to do an MRI to rule that out. Once we did the MRI and that was ruled out, it was confirmed that I had, um, that I did indeed have uh, glaucoma. So my first instinct was, well, can you just give me some antibiotics and I can be done with this glaucoma thing? And she said, that's not how this works. <laughs> and then the next thing was, I thought only patients that were 65 or older got glaucoma. And she said, that's not accurate either. So I was wrong on both accounts of those. <laughs> uh, so what did I do? Well, for me, uh, I wanted to learn more about glaucoma to find out what was happening. And the more I learned, education for me and everybody's different, but I became more empowered with the more information that I learned. Studying glaucoma and researching it, I kept running across high pressure, high pressure. And I said, well, that's not what's going on with me. So I kept diving deeper. And what that led me to was Dr. Flammer's research on vascular dysregulation. And once I read his research and learned more about it and started understanding it and knew that, well, I do have this orthostatic hypotension. When I stand up, I get this head rush. So that seems like this falls into that same category. So the more I learned, um, the more I realized that and learned about Flammer syndrome, the more I realized that I did indeed have this uh, Flammer syndrome. When you have glaucoma, the onus is truly on the patient. So we have to be compliant. We have to decide what treatment we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna accept. And we have to decide what we can tolerate because all of the treatments have side effects. Doctors, what they need to remember is the doctors are used to seeing patients with bad eyes and glaucoma affects all of us differently. So it's important to keep that in mind when you go see your doctor, especially on an emotional level. We're all in different places. And depending on the day, we could have different responses. So it's important to be your own advocate as a glaucoma patient. Um, you wanna ask questions. You wanna find out what are the available treatment options for me? What are the drops I can be on? What are the surgeries that we can do? And what are the side effects associated with all of that? Because everything has side effects, like I said. As Dr. Flammer discussed, there's lots of lifestyle modifications we can make as well. Um, one of the biggest things is not to put your head below your heart because that can increase eye pressure. There's different supplements. Um, meditation has been shown to lower eye pressure. Um, there's breathing techniques and there's EFT or tapping that you can do. One of the other things I've done is I've purchased an eye care home to tonometer so I can measure my pressure at different intervals. Most patients are only, their pressure is only measured once every three to six months at any given time. Our pressure fluctuates throughout the day uh, via the diurnal curve. So depending on any time of the day, your pressure could be higher or lower. If you happen to go into the doctor when your pressure is higher, that pressure gets put on you as that's your pressure all the time. We all know that's not the case. So that's why home tonometry is so important in my opinion. Again, everybody's different. So some people don't want the information. For me, it's what's really helped me. The thing that's scariest to glaucoma patients is our visual field, is losing visual field. So for those of us that have scotomas or blind spots, there's, there's areas we can't see. Well, with two functioning eyes um, or semi-functioning eyes, our brain fills in data because the information is overlapping. But once our central vision, um, we lose too much central vision, our brain's not able to interpolate that data anymore. So that's when we really notice the blind spots and they become more evident in our everyday life. Um, visual field test is so scary to so many patients 
because the visual field test is just confirming where we can't see. And that's really scary to look at, to look at the test and just see a spot of black because we know that's, that's where we're blind. There's still so much to learn about glaucoma, especially normal tension glaucoma. And Dr. Flammer has made an amazing, amazing strides in his research and the information is invaluable to patients like me. But it's important to remember that as Dr. Flammer said, with normal tension glaucoma, you can have low pressures and still have progression of the disease. All this being said, there's still hope, right? There's still people like Dr. Flammer out there that are doing research. There's, there's uh, organizations like the Glaucoma Foundation that's out there funding research in order to find more answers for us. It's important to remember that everyone is going through something that we know nothing about. I like to think of the swan metaphor. So when you see a swan swimming across a lake, they look very gentle and it's very graceful. Underneath that swan, their feet are paddling really voraciously to make that graceful look on top of the water, but underneath the water, there's a lot more going on. That's what happens to us every day. People don't fake being um, anxious or worried. They fake being okay. So a lot of times we're out there and, and it can be really tough and we look graceful and underneath, you know, there's lots more going on. And some days we just can't fake it. And it's all sometimes too much, right? What I do when that happens is I get some perspective and focus, and I'm grateful for the sight that I have left. It's important to appreciate each moment in life because life is lived in the in-between moments, the moments that you don't realize their impact until you look back on them and see their significance. We only have the present moment and it is always today. So live for today and embrace it with gratitude. I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Flammer and the Glaucoma Foundation for sponsoring this webinar to help educate people on normal tension glaucoma and bring more awareness to the disease. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hillary, for sharing your story and for empowering other patients. Uh, our audience has been writing voraciously and I see that we have a lot of questions. And so we will start our Q&A session right now. Uh, first question, Dr. Flemmer, I can check off every symptom of Flemmer syndromes, but I'm not thin. I'm actually overweight. Interestingly enough, my 23 and me says I'm more likely to be thin. So it's more of a statement than a question, but perhaps you would like to comment. Yeah. Uh, this clearly exists. Uh, we do not say this syndrome occurs only in slim people. Slim people have it more often, but obviously can occur also in obese, but uh, much less often, but it can occur, no problem, yes. You also say more often in, in women than in men, but it exists also in men, etc., etc. Yes, Thank it's you. not surprising, yes. Thank you very much. Is Flammer syndrome only found in those with normal tension glaucoma? I have all the symptoms, but I have high tension glaucoma. It can occur, and I, but again, it's it's more often in normal tension glaucoma, but it also occurs in high tension glaucoma, clearly. And it even occurs in healthy people. Um, but it, it occurs about three or four times more often in normal tension glaucoma than in high tension glaucoma, but we see that clearly. Thank you very much. Is there a test that determines Flammer syndrome? Uh, yes, but unfortunately, they are not often avail easy available. Uh, you can do, for example, uh, gene expression test, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Therefore, we say most important is a good patient history. We recommend to the doctors to speak with the patients and ask questions and. Uh, sometimes it's not so simple. For example, if a doctor says to the patient, what about your, your blood pressure? Then they say it's normal. But then if you ask more, then they say, oh, yes, when I was young, I had a terrible low blood pressure. Uh, I asked uh, a lady uh, 
coming with her husband. I said, do you have cold hands? And she said, no, 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 never. And then her husband said, what do you say? Your hands are terrible, cold, um, and so on. So one has to speak with the patient to find out uh, a little bit these this symptoms. And then most, most of the symptoms then are real there. But objective tests, yes, we have them. But again, if I recommend them, they get back uh, the information. I have terrible to find a place where they measure it. So all the objective tests I have listed uh, are unfortunately not available everywhere. Uh, capillary microscopy or dynamic vessel analysis, etc. cetera. Uh, here in, in Europe, particularly in the German speaking area, uh, more and more people have the instruments to measure the dynamic vessel analysis, but uh, normally it is it's enough to good to do a good uh, patient history. Thank you very much. Uh, question for Hillary: How did you get tested for Homer syndrome? Um, so, kind of. Uh... Like Dr. Flammer mentioned, I just went through all of the symptoms. Um, so there was no formal test. I tried to find a place that could test my retinal venous pressure and um, here in the US and I even went to teaching facilities and everything. Um, it's very difficult to find anywhere that tests retinal venous pressure. Um, so with Dr. Flammer, we went through my symptoms and um, just one by one uh, diagnosed me that way. Got it, thank you very much. Next question, Dr. Flemmer is for you. Is there a safe way to increase blood pressure at night? Yes, uh, we normally increase the salt intake at evening. Uh, I like to mention that it's not necessary to bring up the blood pressure to a totally normal range. If people have a very low blood pressure and we increase it only slightly, we already improve the regulation. So low blood pressure and dysregulation are going hand in hand. So if we improve the blood pressure, even only slightly, we already uh, improve the regulation. So normally that's enough. But I saw severe cases who were prog prog progressive despite treatment with, with salt, then we used uh, flutocortisone two times a week, 0.1 uh, milligram or 0.2 milligram, two times a week. So in a very, very low dose, uh, but normally it's not necessary. It, it's difficult to explain the salt because people learn they shouldn't eat so much salt. Uh, and then we, ha we have to explain, yeah, that's absolutely correct. People with a high blood pressure should reduce the salt intake, but people with a too low blood pressure should increase it. And this is sometimes difficult because if I explain to a lady, you should take a little bit more salt. And she said, oh, no, I can't because my husband has a high blood pressure and I cook with salt, without salt. So then they try to explain that you have to, to separate a little bit. You need salt and your husband doesn't need salt. Thank you very much. Next question. What is the prevalence of Flammer syndrome? That's a very difficult question. First of all, it's always a question how one exactly defines it. Second, uh, nobody has done big studies in the normal population. I mean, we know uh, what about our patients have, but uh, epidemiological studies, big ones have not been done so far or only very limited. We know that uh, here in, 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 in Switzerland, it's close to 10% in ladies and about 2% in men. However, it's a big difference. If you look in a city where you have universities and big companies like here in Basel, the pharmaceutical industry, etc., we have much more. If you go to the countryside, you have much less. And because most of the people with Flammer syndrome are, have an indoor work, uh, you don't see Flammer syndrome syndrome in farmers, uh, in gardeners, etc. People who work outside normally don't have the syndrome. So therefore it's very difficult to give exact numbers. But for sure it's also, it occurs more often in Asian countries, particularly in Japan. 
Korea. Korea also a lot. Thank you very much. Next question. Dr. Flammer, thank you for the excellent presentation. I wonder if keeping our hands and feet warm by wearing gloves and socks will help preventing the progression of normal tension glaucoma. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say yes, but I also have to say that's not definitively proven. But we know if we put the hand in cold water, then the blood flow in the eye drops down. This we have measured, this we know for sure. But nobody has done an exact study uh, whether it's better to have it, but I would recommend it definitively. And I also had patients who really acquired a, a acute additional scotoma when they were freezing. I remember a young man who did skiing and he had real cold hands and he suddenly he realized that something is not well in his eye. He came the other day and he had a clear new scotoma. So yes, protect yourself as much as possible. Yes. Thank you very much. Our next question is for you, Hillary. Hillary, could you please share on home tonometry which one do you use, where to get it, and if it's easy to use? Um, so I have the iCare Home 2 tonometer, and you can, I, I purchased, there's several different places to get them. I purchased mine from eyes.net. And um, for me, it was easy to, to learn how to do it. Once you install the software, it works through your phone, so you can see the numbers immediately. It does take, uh, you know, depending on how tech savvy you are, it might be more confusing to set it up. But that initial setup is, is the hardest part. Once you get through that, it's really easy. So you can measure your pressure at any time. And then, like I said, it comes up on your phone. There's also different graphs and reports that you can run on your computer as well that give you the mean eye pressure and eye pressure at certain times. So you you know um, the range of your eye pressure over time. And as Dr. Flamer talked about, the fluctuation is important. So you wanna keep the fluctuation to a minimal. So if you're seeing that you're having significant fluctuations, then you're gonna to wanna to change something about your treatment regimen so that those kind of level out a little bit. Thank you very much. I also wanted to point out, there is a company called myeyes.org that you don't have to buy tonometer. You can actually rent it for, from them for one or two weeks. And uh, there is a financial assistance that comes with it if you qualify it and uh, contact my office for more information on that. Next question for you, Dr. Flemmer. What would be the recommended dosages of ginkgo and magnesium respectively? Uh, ginkgo, well, I know the company recommends today 200 and 40, we still uh, stick with 120. The reason for that is the following. We know if you overdose an antioxidant, then it is it acts as a pro-oxidant. So therefore, be careful and don't overdose uh, antioxidants. So we give 120. And the studies have also been done with 120 both the visual field studies and we have done the studies on oxidative stress uh, and it works with 120. Uh, but I know the company recommends higher dose uh, and it's often used uh, in, in geriatric indications uh, at higher level. In uh, magnesium, it, it depends how well you tolerate it. It can make the error. So if you don't tolerate it, just go back a little bit with the dose. Uh, but you can't overdose magnesium. So it's, in our experience, it's always between 10 and 20 uh, millimole. And we give it a millimole because it, otherwise it depends on which substance you are buying. Uh, but try to go relatively high because if it's relatively low, it doesn't work. And in, in the calcium antagonists go as low as possible. <laughs> it's just the opposite. Thank you very much. Our next question. There is often the recommendation with glaucoma to elevate your head at night, but I've sometimes read that with normal tension glaucoma, the head should not be elevated during sleep. Which guidance is correct? Well, <laughs> it's a little bit complicated. Uh, if you have your head higher, you may have 
uh, a, a little bit lower IOP, but also a little bit lower blood pressure. The perfusion of the eye doesn't change much whether you are a little bit elevated or not. So therefore, I do not recommend specific uh, positions for sleeping. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Flemmer, somebody is asking whether it's possible to schedule a remote appointment with you. Uh, as you see on the screen, I'm quite old. <laughs> I'm retired since 10 years. Uh, but I have, I have good friends who work with me, who know exactly how to deal. Uh, you can always contact me via email and I will try to give you someone who can help you depending on the situation and also depending where you live, et cetera, et cetera. But I myself, unfortunately, <laughs> this time is over. <laughs> I'm, uh, yes, I'm old. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we have time for the questions keep coming and I apologize in advance. We will not be able to answer all of them. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. And so here's one more question. I suffer from migraines. Uh, take triptans from time to time. Are these harmful? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, potentially, yes, potentially, yes. Uh, I Well, it depends what pos possibility you have, but I recommend to the patient to take it and to measure the blood flow in the eye before and after or under with treatment and without treatment to see how you respond because the response of the people are always a little bit different, but it constricts the vessels and uh, this is not what we really like to have. And uh, many migraine itself can constrict the vessels and then dilatate the vessels. And we know migraine is also a risk factor for progression. And so therefore we should try to, if possible, not to use drugs that have an influence on the size of the vessels. So that um, I would be careful. Thank but you. it's not def nobody has done a study on that. I mean, I have to say scientifically it's open, but from my feeling, I would try to use other treatments for my gray. I know it works perfect, but uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And so now this is officially the last question and the last question is for Hillary. Hillary, what do you do if you notice that your eye pressure is higher, that What's normal for you? So currently I am on two different drops. One of the drops, uh, each of the drops I take once a day. So one I take in the morning, one I use at night. Uh, if I, my high, eye pressure is higher in the middle of the day, the, the alpha gain I take in the morning, it can be taken up to three times a day. So um, I would add another drop if I saw it go up as of, I, as of once I've had the tonometer for a while, I don't use it all the time anymore because um, you can you can become obsessive with it. So I you know I know what my relative pressure is during throughout the day just from the experience I've had. But um, as Dr. Flammer talked about, if there's something stressful that comes up, if there's traffic, I notice when I get home from work after that's happened, if I'm super stressed or if there's traffic, I notice I'll take my eye pressure out of curiosity and it'll be higher. So um, it's one of those things too, where I try to do a lot of the, the breathing techniques and, um, and I also incorporate meditation into every day to try to lower eye pressure that way as well. Um, and there's been studies on that that have been done. So um, lots of different um, strategies there, but for the most part, um, I can, the, the, extreme would be to add another drop if I needed to. Thank you so much. So now we've officially reached the end of our webinar. I would like to thank Dr. Flemmer so much for educating us and based on the questions, it was a great success and for conducting such an important research and also for staying up because he's in Sweden and it's almost midnight. Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> oh, my apologies, of course, my apologies. <laughs> And it's almost, it's, but it's still almost midnight in Switzerland. Uh, and I, I would like to thank Hillary Golden for sharing her story, for advocating 
for herself and for teaching others to do the same. Uh, this webinar will be available on our website uh, two days from today. Uh, I hope if you would like to listen to it again, you, you look at it again. And of course, we have a lot of good information on glaucomafoundation.org. Please visit our foundation. Please stay connected with us. Please support us because your dollars go directly to research and support doctors like Dr. Flemmer. I thank you all for your time and have a good night. Bye.